Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved. This more our continuous flow. This is an axial flow device, the HeartMate 2. It's again the same concept, taking blood out of the apex of the heart, going to a pump that pushes the blood past. But this pump is continuously moving. It's going at about 8,000 to 10,000 revolutions per minute. So if the heart is not working very well, you might not feel a pulse on this patient, even though the patient themselves might feel fine. Again, this requires power, so it goes to a controller, the computer that controls the pump, as well as this battery pack that the patient has to wear at all times. This is a schematic of the internal components of the pump. Uh, it's fairly simple, more simple than the initial um, pump in that there's a rotor, sort of like the rotor on a speedboat, and there's two contact points, and basically these, uh, these magnets that allow the rotor to spin. So this, the blood comes through here, gets churned up, and so there is some hemolysis that happens, uh, and we'll talk about the consequences of that, and then the, and then the, the blood goes to the aorta. The newer generation of devices, the hardware device, is smaller uh, and it's actually a centrifugal pump. So the blood spins around in a circle and then gets ejected from uh, the outflow cannula. This uh, device is so small that it can be placed inside the pericardium of the heart. So it allows our surgeons more latitude to place pumps in different parts of the body, including the right ventricle. Um, the other thing is that this rotor has no contact points. It's actually levitated in a pool of blood so there's supposed to be less wear and tear on this device. This device is only approved for British transplant. Uh, there's recent data that came out of ICHLT suggesting that this could be also used for destination therapy patients. <coughs> there are differences in the two kinds of pumps. Um, so the heart mate is axial flow and the heart wear is centrifugal flow. Um, what we see is that the axial flow pumps are less sensitive to afterload, whereas the centrifugal pumps are much more sensitive. The higher the blood pressure, the less flow that you get, and that's just uh, evidenced by these uh, HQ curves that you see here. The nice thing is that these pumps, the centrifugal pumps, can actually run at a much lower speed. So the hypothesis is that they, you could have less hemolysis with these pumps. Um, as I mentioned, the limitation is that these pumps need a power source. So in, in general, these power sources last for eight to 12 hours, and then the patient has to change their batteries. In the future, the hope is that these pumps will be internalized and we can charge these batteries transcutaneously. And then they, they wouldn't need a drive line, eliminating the, the risk of infection. So what about the benefits and complications? You know, what is the evidence that this therapy works? So this is one of the first trials, the rematch trial in 2001, that looked at destination therapy patients with a pulsatile pump. The medical therapy arm was chosen very carefully. These were patients who were receiving inotropic therapy um, and were not thriving. Uh, they were still declining and had um, an injection fraction of less than 25%. What you can see is that this group had an abysmal mortality. Uh, at two years, 8% of patients in the medical therapy arm were alive. So 92% of patients had died at two years. Very sick patient population. The right population to think about using a, a new therapy that could have um, dra dramatic side effects. In the LVAD group, the outcomes were better. And what you see at one year is that there was about 50% survival. The problem is, and you can see this just as well as I can, these curves converge at two years. So this therapy was definitely better at one year, even at one and a half years. It doesn't look so great at two years. Uh, so at two years, there was a 15% absolute risk reduction in mortality. Still, you treat about eight patients or seven patients and you save one life. Um, the deaths in the medical group, as you might expect, were due to heart failure. And uh, the deaths in the LVAD group were due to sepsis <coughs> and device failure. This was the first trial to show the complications of LVAD therapy. So a significant proportion had infection, bleeding, and device failure. What about the newer generation of devices? So in 2009, um, this was another destination therapy trial. They randomized the HeartMate 2, which was an axial continual flows device, against the uh, HeartMate XVE, because that was now the new standard of therapy. And they found at two years a 60% survival. Remember, it was two years 20 or 15% uh, survival um, in the pulsatile group. So this was a dramatic improvement, and this is what really put LVAD therapy on the map. That's when we started putting in LFADs in our patients in about 2010. The data it continues to improve. So that was a clinical trial. If you look at registry data, uh, 
after the trial was uh, finished, now we're seeing one year survival of about 73% in LVAD patients, 63% at two years. So more and more we're seeing this as a viable therapy for our patients. What about bridge to transplant patients? Actually, they have very similar amounts of complications, uh, even though you might think that they're less sick because they're transplant candidates. Still a 9% uh, risk of stroke at 10, 8, 18 months, infection, and bleeding. However, the outcomes overall are quite good. So this is at two years. In a bridge to transplant population, 82% of patients are alive. Now, again, these patients have an out. They could get transplanted. So what you see is 40% of patients got transplanted, half of that total. But still, there was a significant proportion of patients on support, 34%. This trial was one of the first to show that even though patients survive on LVAD, they do have other complications and they get admitted to hospital quite frequently. Every year, a patient on average gets admitted at least once with an LVAD for a number of reasons. Um, these patients do, however, have improvements in quality of life. So Jill Rogers, who's at Duke, looked at quality of life in, a, in both bridge to transplant and destination therapy patients. He found that the six minute walk distance improved and so did quality of life scores. Um, and this is what you see, that at baseline, patients were NYSHA class four, so essentially more abundant bed bound, and they improved over time. That improvement was also sustained. So because of that, I think we've had more acceptance in our community and, and worldwide for LVAD therapy. This is our volume for LVADs and transplants. And as you can see, we've steadily increased our volume. Last year, we did 48 LVADs, 50 transplants. This year, by the end of the week, we'll have done 25 LVADs, well ahead of our pace for last year. And I think we've done 18 transplants. Um, we don't care just about survival. We care about the quality of life for our patients. I show this slide at every um, transplant meeting. What this shows is what happens to our patients. The orange is time spent out of hospital. The red is a hospitalization, and the green is a transplant hospitalization. So what we want to see is a lot of orange, right? We want to see our patients out of hospital. And in our bridge to transplant population, that's essentially what we see. A destination therapy population is more sick, and so the X's are, are deaths. And I'll show you the Kaplan-Meier mortality in a bit. Um, but we've had very good outcomes. We have patients now who are approaching, who are past four years on LVAD support. So our patients always ask us, how long can I expect to be alive on this device? We don't yet know what to tell them because our cohort hasn't uh, been alive or hasn't gone far enough for us to, to say on average how long an LVAD patient will survive. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve. So um, what you can see is that for all survival, we're above 80% at one year. And then for DTVAD, actually, we're also at 80%, which was surprising to me when I put the data together this morning. Um, you can also see that after a year, we don't have much of a decrement. We're very happy to see this mortality. I'm not so happy to see this mortality between one and two years. And that's what we're going to be working on in the next phase of our program. If you look at other outcomes like stroke, that data is pretty comparable to that data I showed you from the uh, mid-trial from Student Park. Similar uh, rates of stroke lower rates of drive-on infection, lower rates of sepsis. So now we'll sort of talk about the research aspect. And I think uh, Dr. Ha is going to talk, uh, speak to the bulk of this. But there's a lot of complications of LVADs. We're going to focus on two today. One is bleeding, and the other is left ventricular recovery, getting patients better on support. So in terms of bleeding, the problem is that LVADs themselves cause bleeding. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with this phenomenon called Heidi syndrome. When patients have aortic stenosis, they get shearing of their blood. And not just the blood cells get sheared, but also the clotting factors. So von Willebrand's factor is a clotting factor that gets sheared and becomes dysfunctional. So a lot of patients with aortic stenosis develop acquired von Willebrand syndrome. Well, essentially, the same thing happens with LVAD patients because their von Willebrand multimers are also being sheared. There's pretty good research coming out of Minnesota uh, suggesting that in a pulsatile VAD, you don't get that derangement in your LVAD von Willebrand factor multimers, but every patient with a continuous flow LVAD gets a shearing and acquired von Willebrand syndrome. Uh, because of that, they get more bleeding um, and get more blood products, which is another risk factor for poor outcomes after LVAD. Um, Justin Schaefer, who's a cardiothoracic surgery resident here, when he was a medical student at Hopkins, looked at bleeding and found that bleeding predicted mortality in patients receiving LVADs. And we know that bleeding is a big deal. 40% of patients develop GI bleeding uh, in the Mount Sinai cohort. <coughs> so there's a number of ways to um, address this. Some patients are taken off of antithrombotic therapy. 
uh, some, in some patients, we try to be a bit more circumspect about their anticoagulation. Uh, using stud, or, um, assays like thromboelastography, putting blood in a cup and with a pin and seeing what the clotting uh, profile of the blood is and whether we can um, decrease their antiplatelet agents. So these, I'll just go through a couple of cases very quickly. This is a patient who um, had an ischemic cardiomyopathy, um, was recommended for transplant, and came to Stanford. While they were being worked up for transplant, he came to the emergency room for three shocks, came to the, uh, uh, was intubated, and then came to the CCU. We put a balloon pump in, uh, placed extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. That was then removed, and the patient had an LVAD. Unfortunately, that's not where the story stops. He got the LVAD, did well, but then he bled. In August of 2012, he had a hemoglobin of six, which is about mm, less than half of what it should be. But what do we do in those situations? And this was a man who was not very compliant. He would not get his INR drawn for his Coumadin, and we couldn't ever be sure that he was taking his medications. This is a marker of thrombosis, LDH, lactate dehydrogenase. Um, and this is what happened to him um, shortly after he had the bleeding, his LDH had gone up. So we actually took him off of his anticoagulation completely. Remember, patients with LVADs are still anticoagulated because they have acquired von Willebrand syndrome. So we just crossed our fingers and hoped in this patient that he would do well because the risk of bleeding was much higher than the risk of clotting. So surprising to me, uh, he is still doing well three years later. Uh, and he goes to Texas and dances the rumba. And he never tells us when he's going there. Uh, second case report is a little bit more interesting. So this was a 66-year-old man who had another ischemic cardiomyopathy who about three years ago had a HeartMate 2 LVAD placed. He also bled. So he came in April of 2012 with bleeding, this time to a hemoglobin of three. That's almost, you know, you can't sustain life at that uh, level. His anticoagulation was decreased and then he bled again. So we stopped anticoagulation just like the last patient. And we were hoping that it was going to go well. Then he had a heart attack because he was off of anticoagulation. Then he had um, his spleen infarcted. And then finally he came to, uh, to our hospital with signs suggested that his pump had clotted. While we were uh, determining what to do, his LVAD just stopped in the CCU. So that was an emergency situation, and we took, and Dr. Ha took him expeditiously to the operating room and took out his LVAD and put a new one in. We tried to use anticoagulation again, but because he kept bleeding, uh, we eventually decided to use a new agent, or a, an old agent actually, but a new agent for LVADs, thalidomide. Thalidomide you might be familiar with is an anti-angiogenic uh, medication, and it was banned by the FDA for pregnant women because it caused limb loss in, in infants because it's anti-angiogenic and limbs wouldn't grow. So we thought about using it in our patients uh, based on some data, and in this patient it worked amazingly well. He's not bled since. So it's used in other conditions in patients who develop arteriovenous malformations, like hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, I apologize for the typo. So we've we published that case report that I just mentioned to you already, and now we have a case series of about 10 patients who've received thalidomide and have resolution of their bleeding uh, after LVAD placement. So that's one aspect of, of research for LVADs. Another aspect is remodeling. So um, Dr. Fowler is here. He knows that um, after uh, the, the hope with anti-adrenergic therapy is that you'd have improved myocardial beta receptor signaling. That's also what we see after an LVAD is placed. We hope that the heart shrinks and that there's less cell death. That's also what happens. So Dr. Ha is going to talk more about the basic science aspect of myocardial recovery. Is Great. Oh, he's going to be back so you can clap some more later. <laughs> uh, two disclosures. Number one, um, this is a little bit like those reality shows where you take somebody, you put in a different situation, you swap. So it's like wife swap. Me and Deep are a little bit different because uh, <clears throat> I'm giving the basic science part of it, which is kind of, and he's been talking about the surgical part of it. So that's one disclosure. The other disclosure is that I'm horrible at pronouncing the names of proteins and stuff. When I was in the lab, I was known for that. So I'd, people would be like FAS ligand, I'd be like FAS, and you know, FAC staining, I'd be FACS, and I would, ATF would be a, a alcohol tobacco firearms for me. So I apologize ahead of time if I slaughter some of the names of the proteins that I'm talking about. So I'm going to go into more of the basic science part of uh, reverse remodeling. And I'll talk initially about continuum of ventricular recovery, then the reverse remodeling mechanisms, of which you can break down to different components. 
And then uh, Deep will actually talk about the case report conclusion. So the continuum of ventricular recovery, this is really important to understand when we start talking about you know, actually getting patients off of ADS and back onto their, their own heart for pump function. Uh, you know, it's a continuum. It's not really a, you know, stage is not really demarcated, but initially is the uh, myocardial insult. It could be whatever, valvular disease, ischemic disease, uh, DCM, which causes maladaptive remodeling. Uh, that causes the, the problem that we try to treat in the first place. Then we apply a treatment, which is our hope is to cause reverse remodeling. But reverse remodeling is more of a, a, a biologic phenomenon. It's not a clinical phenomenon yet. And then when you get to myocardial recovery, that's when we talk about the clinical phenomena of actual myocardial recovery where we can actually remove patients from whatever device is being uh, supported. At, and at the bottom, you can see cessation of treatment. And in terms of what we do, how we study this, you know, VADS is a unique phenomenon because we take a patient who's got DCM, we put a VAD in, we core out the apex of the ventricle. That apex, that core can be sent to labs and then they can, you know, our labs here, we can freeze it, we can bank it, we can study it. And that's, that's pre-treatment. And then afterwards, a lot of these patients go on to transplant. So then you have the VAD explant and then you have the heart explanted. So you can see the effect of having a VAD in, in place for months, years, however long the VAD's in, to see what effect it has on the heart and the tissue and the muscle and the, and the, bio, bio, <clears throat> and the bi biology of it all. So that's really you know, a good way to study this. And a lot of these studies I'll, I'll, I'll be showing, that's what they did. So you can break down the mechanisms into really four general things. I'll talk about the first three and leave the fourth one off uh, in, in, in uh, regards to time, because I think we're already running pretty behind schedule. The first thing is cardio, cardiac myocyte biology. I'll talk about the extracellular matrix and the sympathetic nervous system. Within cardiomyocyte biology, there's for even more detailed things to talk about, cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, apoptosis and reverse remodeling, calcium handling, uh, sarcomeric and cytoskeletal protein number and structure. So a um, uh, hallmark of heart failure is an increase in cardiomyocyte size uh, in, in terms of uh, hypertrophy, in terms of cross-section. You can see in the, uh, on the uh, chart here, this side, Gray is a, a normal patient. This is, black is a patient uh, cardiomyopathy uh, prior to LVAD, and white is post-LVAD. You can see this is cardiomyocyte cross-section. It goes up and it goes back down. And in this uh, picture here, you can see this is pre-LVAD uh, implant. This is after LVAD removal at heart transplant. And you see a difference in, in size of the uh, myocytes. Interestingly enough, uh, that decrease in myocyte size doesn't correlate with uh, myocardial recovery. So Clinton, it hasn't yet correlated with patients who, you, could, you can say, well, it decreases in side, size, but it's more correlated with reverse remodeling, but it's not necessarily correlated with clinical myocardial recovery. Um, apoptosis, a third of all cardiomyocyte losses is due to apoptosis and heart failure, as we know. Uh, after unloading, uh, you can see that there's a decrease in apoptosis, although the evidence is not clear and decisive yet. Uh, here it looks decisive. Tunnel staining done on, on cells pre-VAD and post-VAD show there's a decrease in tunnel staining. But tunnel staining really identifies cells undergoing apoptosis a little bit later in the, in the apoptotic pathway. So early cells that, that are undergoing apoptosis are not clearly defined by tunnel staining, so we may be missing that. And as you can see on the right, the cardiomyocyte diameter drops with, uh, with LVADs. Um, <clears throat> after LVAD, uh, on the, you can, the, the, the important thing here is the chart at the bottom there. Uh, with increasing time on, on VADs, you can see there's an increasing expression of, of FAS and BCLXL, all involved in the apoptotic uh, pathway. And these are other things that happen. Cytochrome C levels are decreased, uh, which is a, uh, a mediator of mitochondrial apoptotic pathways. There's upregulation of various genes in, involved in cell growth, DNA repair, and apoptosis. NF-kappa B. Uh, is reduced and normalized after LVAD support. And uh, uh, mitogen activated uh, protein kinases such as ERK and AKT are dramatically decreased after mechanical unloading. <clears throat> so here's uh, uh, ERK and AKT. You can see at the top is uh, some slides that show that pre donor heart versus pre-VAD versus post-LVAD, you can see a decrease in, in the uh, 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 expression. Uh, and the bottom slide is, is interesting because uh, the subendocardial versus subepicardial uh, uh, expression of, of ERK is actually different. Uh, it's, it's decreased in the uh, subepicardial uh, area of the heart. Uh, 
Um, but in general, it's, it's decreased from pre to post VAD as well. In terms of the myocyte function itself, uh, myocardial contraction, uh, VADs actually uh, increase the function of the actual myocyte function. Uh, you can look at the, all the different uh, 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 things here, magnitude of shortening, time to peak contraction, time to 50% relaxation, rate of shortening, and rate of relengthening. And all of them are st statistically significantly better, uh, which indicates that there is some sort of reverse remodeling going on from a functional standpoint. And part of this may be due to cal changes in calcium uh, handling by the myocyte. Uh, calcium derangements during heart failure, we all know that there's decrease in inter internal calcium. Uh, there's reuptake of calcium by circuit A2A, ATPase, it's impaired. Uh, LVAD support is associated with the uh, uh, increase in ATPase, so the circuit A2A, ATPase, and upper regulation and reuptake of calcium. And uh, in myocardial recovery, the actual clinical recovery, we see that there's better excitation contraction coupling. So this is the calcium current density for, uh, if you look at the LVAD cores and the hearts that are removed after heart transplant, the donor heart is this open square curve and the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the uh, LVAD core, which is pre-treatment with LVAD, is this uh, closed triangle and the uh, up-pointing up triangle and the, the down-pointing triangle is the post-VAD. As you can see, the calcium current density is pretty much recovered back to uh, uh, some, a somewhat normal uh, curve. Charge density is also better, uh, almost back up to donor uh, levels. LVAD core is much uh, lower and the post-LVAD is higher. And then uh, the uh, cyclastic reticulum calcium content uh, is actually increased significantly post-LVAD, which is kind of different than the donor and the LVAD core. Again, for calcium ha handling in terms of myocardial recovery, uh, when it, the, the thing about re uh, uh, reverse remodeling versus myocardial recovery, in patients who actually have myocardial recovery, you actually see a change in, for the better in, the, in their action potential. Their action potential duration here is actually almost recovered back to uh, <clears throat> normal. So patients are, are actually much better. The transplanted versus LVAD cord, there's no, no difference, but patients who actually recover, who actually we explant the VAD, <clears throat> they actually have a better uh, action potential duration and all these other uh, uh, charts uh, I go into, but we kind of running out of time, so I gotta skip that real quick. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, mRNA expression of circa A2A um, after LVAD is, uh, is better. Again, uh, in terms of calcium, <clears throat> uh, EPAC2 is involved with uh, cyclic AMP mechanisms with calcium within the myocyte um, and uh, Interestingly, uh, for recovered patients, it's significantly better for patients who we explant the VADs. For non-recovered patients who go to transplant and never get uh, uh, recovered, uh, there's no real change. So there's also changes in the uh, cytoskeletal structure, uh, sarcomeric and cytoskeletal structure in the myocyte uh, dystrophin. Uh, its N-terminal disruption is, is associated with uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, LVAD actually reverses this. Uh, multiple proteins are associated with reverse remodeling and myocardial recovery. Um, so all the contractile proteins, they're, they're increased uh, <clears throat> or they're decreased with myocardial recovery, laminase C, vinculin, and beta integrin signaling. So the next uh, topic is extracellular matrix changes. This is a little bit interesting and confounding. The, uh, <clears throat> uh, during heart failure, there's an increase in collagen type one, an increased ratio of type one to type three, and increased cross-linking fibrosis. After unloading, there's no clear decrease or increase in collagen, and I'll show some slides here to, show, to, to kind of, you, you would hope that there would be a decrease in collagen, but uh, some slides don't in, indicate, some studies don't indicate that. And uh, it's uh, maybe due to multiple factors. The interesting thing is the, the effect of ACE inhibitors on this. In 2005, in circulation, Clotes et al. Uh, found that uh, for heart failure and LVAD unloading, uh, there was an increased type one to type three collagen ratio, the increased collagen cross-linking and increased stiffness. Um, <clears throat> the uh, white is a normal, this is black is pre-LVAD uh, and uh, gray is post-LVAD. And you can see that in all, the stiffness is increased, collagen is increased, total collagen is increased, cross-linking has increased, which is uh, not what we hope to see. 
<coughs> that being said, another study in 2006 was published which showed that there, <coughs> um, there were some changes uh, in cross-linking that initially got worse with uh, the initial 100 to 150 days on LVAD, but over time decreased significantly when you got out to 400, 500 days on LVAD, which is a long time. The interesting effect is how ACE inhibitors affect this. And, and uh, ACE inhibitors actually decrease the uh, collagen content, collagen cross-linking, and that kind of supports some of the studies that have been done to maybe uh, use ACE inhibitors to enhance the, the, the uh, reverse remodeling. So in this table, you can see that uh, patients with LVAD without ACE, pre-LVAD, post-LVAD, their total collagen got worse, but with ACE inhibitors, it got better. Uh, same thing with the other uh, 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 things they were looking at here, the uh, soluble collagen and the cross-linked collagen. In addition, uh, the MMPs and TIMPs uh, have a key role in the maintenance of the extracellular matrix. MMPs are increased with heart failure and there's a decrease in TIMPs. Uh, and uh, with LVAD therapy, uh, you can see that there is an increase in uh, MMP, uh, a decrease in MMP expression. Uh, here's normal, here's black is uh, heart failure, blue is uh, LVAD without ACE inhibitor, and then you add an ACE inhibitor and it gets even better. Um, <clears throat> other genes involved in, uh, in, in fibrosis are also uh, noted to be increased in HF, uh, but decreased in LVAD patients, and uh, uh, patients who have my, actual true myocardial recovery versus non-recovery uh, have decreased fibrosis compared to pre-VAD. So uh, really quickly, uh, sympathetic nervous system. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, there's reduced norep norepinephrine uptake in, in patients with heart failure and decreased norepinephrine transport activity. LVAD unloading actually restores the, the uh, norep norepinephrine reuptake mechanism and improves the sympathetic tone of the heart. Um, and using a, a mega, uh, MIBG scanning with LVAD unloading and pharmacologic support, you can see improved sympathetic function. And uh, this is uh, the density of beta receptors. <coughs> uh, and you can see in, in patients with heart failure, it's significantly decreased with VADs. It's, uh, it's increased, not back to baseline, but it's, uh, it's, it's better than with heart failure. Thanks. Thank you. So Dr. Ha went over the, the rationale for uh, much of the therapy that we use now to try to get patients to recovery. The first trial that looked at that um, was from Emma Burks in 2006, <coughs> and she thought, well, let's take patients who get an LVAD who now can tolerate antiadrenergic therapy. Um, they picked patients who had a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, so they didn't have hearts that were infarcted, and they gave them very high doses of the typical therapy we give patients with heart failure. So Dr. Ha already mentioned lisinopril, that's an ACE inhibitor, and that's, a very, that's the highest recommended dose. Carvedilol at a very high dose, losartan, also renin-angiotensin blockade, and spironolactam. They also gave them a beta-2 agonist to cause myocyte hypertrophy, and um, they enrolled 27 patients. So of the patients that um, were excluded from, after the patients, some patients were excluded from the trial, um, they found that almost all of these patients were explanted, 11 out of 15 which seems too good to be true, and I think it definitely was, because they included patients who had reversible causes for cardiomyopathy, so chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy and peripartum cardiomyopathy. To be fair to them, these patients were very sick. They had a very low ejection fraction, 12%, and a very low um, cardiac index. A more contemporary study by the same group looked at patients with continuous flow devices, and so these patients um, also had dilated cardiomyopathy, 23 patients, Interestingly, three of them died after implantation. Um, they were very young. Again, these patients you might think would recover because they didn't have an, uh, their heart failure for a very long time. 60% of these patients recovered to be explanted, but again, it was a little bit too good to be true. If you actually look at the schematic of the, the patients, so 23 were, in the, were enrolled, three of them died perioperatively. Then of the eight that didn't recover, three of them died. Um, of the 12 that did recover, two of those died. So it doesn't actually look quite as good as, as you might expect. Um, but this trial did show the sort of um, machinations you should go to, the protocol, to get a patient to recover. Um, 
they did ramp protocols. So they, did, they would do echocardiograms and go down on the speed to see what the heart looked like. They would do invasive hemodynamic assessments, which we've done as well in our patient population. And what they found on average was that the patients who recovered had a very short time period that they were in heart failure. The patients who didn't recover were in heart failure for five years. And that makes intuitive sense. It's common sense. The longer that you have this chronic disease, the more you'll have irreversible changes that will not allow for recovery. So this is a patient of mine, actually, one of our first destination therapy patients, I think the first patient, who um, had an LVAD implanted four years ago. She was asymptomatic from a heart failure standpoint, but she was unhappy because she didn't like to car carry batteries and she couldn't do water aerobics. So again, we don't know why she wanted to do water aerobics, but she couldn't do them. So she asked our team if the LVAD could be explanted. Um, and the problem with explanting an LVAD, it's actually a very big operation. You have to take out the inflow cannula, you have to take out the outflow cannula. Uh, some patients would not tolerate that. She wasn't eligible for transplant. She had a psychiatric evaluation that suggested that she was competent to make this decision to stop her LVAD support. So we did many of the things that were done in the Burks protocol. Uh, I took her to the cath lab and dropped her to 6,000 RPMs, which is negligible support. And her heart function was still good. We thought that an operation was going to be too much for her. And so Dr. Ha and Dr. Oyer thought of an innovative way to stop her LVAD support. They said, well, instead of taking the whole LVAD out, why not just leave it in and turn it off? The problem is that if you turn it off, then a clot will form, and then the patient will have clot going throughout their body and not survive. But what if you could stop that clot from propagating? And so what Dr. Ha and uh, Dr. Dake and Dr. Oyer thought of was, Let's put a catheter in the outflow cannula of the LVAD and just inflate it. Then all flow will stop and no clot can get past it. And that's what they did. And I thought it was crazy, particularly since it was my patient. But we thought, you know, let's give it a shot. And so they went retrograde through the aorta, put an Amplatz catheter here in the outflow. So blood should be flowing from the pump into the aorta. They, put, they inflated the Amplatz catheter here, or plug here, and now no blood can get into the aorta. So now no clot can get in here, and we turned the pump off. The problem is that there was still the inflow cannula, so then we decided to keep the patient on anticoagulation indefinitely. Um, this is just another <coughs> three-dimensional CT view of that procedure. Here's where the Amplatz plug is. You can see it here in more detail. Um, so the upshot is that she's now two years out from that procedure uh, on anticoagulation and enjoying her life. So that was the first report uh, of this procedure being performed. We hope to continue performing these procedures in patients who qualify. Uh, so the future is that you know, we want to keep determining. The holy grail for an LVAD is you put the LVAD in, and then the patient doesn't need the LVAD anymore, and you can take it out. That's what we're hoping to do for every single patient. I don't think that we'll be able to do that for every patient, but we have to figure out which patients we can do that in and which ways we can promote myocardial recovery. One of those ways that you can promote myocardial recovery, you know I'm probably the least qualified person to talk about that in this room, is stem cells. You may have seen this commercial. The first heart transplant in America took place right here at Stanford. And we're still pushing... There's Dr. Ha. Right now, we're repairing the heart naturally. Instead of using artificial materials, when we can, we rebuild your heart with its own natural tissue. And soon, we'll regrow your heart with your own stem cells. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen here. All right. Discover more right. at stanfordhealthcare.org. <clears throat> so it's going to happen here, right? But that's five years from now, right? Or 10 years from now. Actually, it's right now. Uh, we're going to be enrolling in a trial for stem cells injected into patients who receive left ventricular assist devices. Dr. Ha and I just went to the investigator meeting about a month ago or a couple weeks ago. This is a prospective trial sponsored by the NHLBI um, in a randomized trial of, L of um, mesenchymal precursor cells in LVAD patients. They already did the phase two trial, which showed that there was no, none of the patients in the, in the treatment arm died, and there was some evidence of myocardial recovery over and above the control group in the patients who got stem cells. So the objectives are, first of all, safety. Make sure that these patients uh, do okay with stem cells, because we know that there's a risk of arrhythmia and, and other problems. Um, they'll be followed for about one year or if they get transplanted, until they get transplanted. The outcomes are looking for allosensitization, 
because we're giving pa these patients some other patient cells. So maybe they'll develop allosensitization. Survival, obviously. And then the ability to wean the LVAD. If we can decrease LVAD support, that could promote myocardial recovery. And there are some very careful assessments that we're going to be doing with echocardiograms, and I think Dr. Yang is going to be part of these in the echocardiogram lab, echocardiography lab, which I think is going to be fascinating to see if these patients can recover. Um, so in summary, you know, I think that this is a really exciting time for uh, to enter the MCS field because we're involved in a lot of research. There's multi-center trials. Uh, Dr. Ha is a uh, site investigator on HeartMate 3 and MVAD. Reliant Heart, which is a new kind of uh, LVAD. The Syncardia Total Artificial Heart, we're looking at uh, smaller pumps for smaller patients, and the stem cells trial I just mentioned. But Stanford has really made its reputation based on translational research, right, and basic science research. So we've done proof of concept uh, trials here. Thalidomide for GI bleeding, we're doing a trial, which may not be as exciting for a basic science crowd, activity monitoring in LVAD patients. How long does it take a patient to recover after they get an LVAD? We don't know. Um, we're doing a lot of database research. We're hopefully about to publish a paper on looking at the hemodynamic evaluation of LVAD. Dr. Ha just presented an abstract in France uh, about the allosensitization of LVAD patients and its effect on post-LVAD outcomes. So if you're all at all interested, this is a good time to get in on the ground floor because there's a lot that we don't know about LVAD, so I'd be the first to admit that, and there's a lot that we can discover. This is our team, um, Dr. Ha, Marie Lug one of our coordinators, Dr. Wu, Matt Wheeler, all the fellows and coordinators really <coughs> serve as the backbone of this program. Um, you can approach any of us, I think, if you're interested in learning more about LVADs or MCS or interested in research. Um, if you're more interested in research or in details about MCS, serendipitously, we're having a symposium this Saturday at the Ritz-Carlton Half Moon Bay. So this is the information. Uh, you can call one of us or email one of us. But this will, we will go in much more depth than we did today. This was just a smattering of, of what MCS entails at that symposium. So again, you can call or email us. Um, I didn't put Rich's um, phone number up there because I didn't want to be presumptuous. Um, I put my phone number up there. And then, um, yeah, I think that, that we're good. So I think we actually finished on time, surprisingly, and we'll take some questions. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so so it's it's hard to say because you know for sure the the pre vad point is you know is pretty similar across all patients. They're pretty they usually state NYHA class three or four at the time you take the core for analysis. <laughs> the point at which they get to transplant or recovery, you know, recovery it's usually far along. It's it's hard to know exactly when their time course they're going to be physiologically. But for heart transplant, <laughs> it's variable. It can be two to three months after the VAD, all the way up to a couple of years. And it's, it's hard to know exactly during that, you know, timeline, you know, you're, you're actually, you, we, we know exactly when we take it, but if you take all the patients, it's not really, you know, centered around a certain time. There's a mean time for all the studies, which is usually about, uh, usually about five to six months, but, uh, but that's kind of, you know, it's variable. Yeah, well, well we don't go ahead. We don't actually we we actually don't measure those biochemical markers yet. I mean, that's the hope is that with with further research, you can actually start to define when when patients are you know using biochemical markers when they're actually getting to the point of either recovery or they're not going to recover, and you can make a better decision: should we continue on with the VAD and try to get to uh, clinical recovery? Um, and it, that's kind of a lot of people are working on that type of thing so that we can better identify patients who would be a candidate for actual explantation of the VAD and letting them recover. Um, but right now we don't really, we don't really, you know, as far as I know, take any markers and, and look at it and say, hey, you, were, you know, recover. We just use functional, uh, you know, and physiological uh, uh, 
So that we're, I think it's a great question, and we just don't know, right? I mean, part of these trials that are that are uh, we're going to be doing are going to be answering that exact question: How often should you be measuring for markers of biochemical recovery? Francois Haddad, who we work very closely with, is the head of the biomarker lab here. We're looking at that right now: Which markers of inflammation uh, change, and what is the cadence of that change from the time of VED? And just like Dr. Ha mentioned, we don't know how to titrate our therapy, right? So. Once we start seeing changes, should we be more aggressive? You know, we would like to be able to titrate our therapy based on the biochemical response. And hopefully the trials that we're going to be doing will lay the groundwork for al allowing us to do that. Right. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Porath. Lovely talk. Um, Right, let's see. I didn't realize we had so many slides. Um, so while I'm backpedaling, I think the, the issue is that, again, the fundamental end answer is that we don't know for sure. But what I suspect is that there, is, there are angiogenic factors released when you have an LVAD placed because of the hemolysis and because of the acquired von Willebrand syndrome. And for that reason, I think, again, we don't really know why patients with Heidi's syndrome develop AVMs in their gut either, but they do, and I suspect it's angiogenic. Why do I suspect that? Because there's a lot of uh, debate in the LVAD community right now about how we should treat GI bleeding. Some people will just take patients off of anticoagulation completely. That can be good, but with the increased risk of pump thrombosis, that doesn't seem like the best solution. Other people will inject octreotide. You know better than I do that octreotide will cause splanchnic vasoconstriction, but, it, but as soon as you stop the octreotide, the bleeding comes back. What we've seen, and this is why I think it's an angiogenic phenomenon, if you give them thalidomide, you don't see AVMs anymore, the AVMs resolve. And, and once the thalidomide comes off, there are select patients that don't develop AVMs anymore. So I suspect it's because they develop these AVMs from angiogenesis. If you can cut that problem off at the root and uh, inhibit angiogenesis, then you can stop the bleeding. Red blood cells, so, so shearing of red blood cells and uh, um, von Willebrand's factor. I don't know of any others that are that are adversely affected by L the LVAD. Part. That's a that's a great question because, in addition to that, there's also some theory that the lack of pulsatility causes AVMs as well. Right. And you know because the, the the energy wave of a pulse actually is enough to you know the, the red blood cell diameter at the, is is greater than the capillaries at the mic, you know, microscopic level. The energy level of the pulse actually is possible. It can push that. Uh, red blood cell through the capillary. But without the pulse, there's no, you know, they don't have that energy. So the question is, does that contribute to AVM formation? Part of, the, a lot of this will hopefully, you'll start to answer with the HeartMate 3 device. That device actually has bigger gap channels. So it causes less shearing of the red blood cells and the platelets. So hopefully, and, and, let, and, and they're theor theorizing less shearing of, uh, you know, v, uh, von Willebrand's factor. So that may give us an idea. But in addition, it also has a built-in uh, pulse, so it's not as you know, it's not up to you know our normal pulses, but it's actually around you know 20 to 30 beats per you know. So it's actually it's built in to actually have a pulse wave. So hopefully that'll answer. If patients on this device don't have AVMs, and we have a little bit of our answer. Yep. Gary, you look like you have a question, but you're too relaxed. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, there's, as you can imagine, all the inflammatory markers get worse, like IL-6, um, uh, CRP. So there, there's fairly uh, good papers out there which I can send you uh, uh, early on. But we're more interested in the profile of what, you know, it's easy to say that there's going to be more inflammation after an LVAD is placed in. What do you do about that and, and how does it affect a patient? You know, so much of the work that we're doing is determining what the expected recovery is for patients and what, how we can predict events. So what we, what we want to do is tie that cytokine profile to an event. Okay, this is a cytokine profile that makes us suspicious that a patient will have a stroke or a thrombosis. Then we can hopefully react and prevent that event. All right, I think our time is up. All right, thank you.
Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved.